Hi there, Anthony Llewellyn here again from Bad Med Bosses. We're supported by Advanced Med. Welcome to our video series where we talk about how both trainees and senior doctors can improve the culture in medicine. If you like what you're seeing in our vlog, uh, we'd really encourage you to subscribe and turn on the notifications so that you can get our regular content. I'm aiming to put out a video at least once a week, so please help us by subscribing. So today we're talking about coaching and I see this as a bit of a mini series within a series. So what we'd like to do with the YouTube channel in combination with a blog course site is talk about some of the things that senior doctors can do to improve uh, how they can perform as a boss in medicine. Of course, coaching is one of those topics and there's a lot to coaching so I can see four or five or six videos just around that particular topic. But actually I think this will be helpful to trainees as well because uh, you'll see how coaching can be a technique, uh, an option, a thing you can do that can help you resolve a range of issues at whatever le uh, level uh, that you are in your medical career. So let's talk about what we're going to cover today. So in today's video, uh, we're going to talk about what is coaching. Now, I know that's a topic that's covered well over the internet, so I am going to try and make it unique and contextualize the medicine because you can go and find a definition anywhere for yourself. But I think it is worth us spending a little bit of time just defining what coaching is and particularly looking at how coaching might differ from some of the other approaches that a lot, a lot of doctors may already be familiar with in medicine. So, you know, I'm talking about things like mentoring and supervising. I'd like to talk a little bit about why I and a lot of other people think that coaching might be useful in medicine. And because we are doctors, and because we're always looking for the evidence, I'm going to cover the evidence um, and, and sort of give you a little bit of insight into the evidence strength around coaching. And I think it's probably helpful to leave with a few examples. So we'll, we'll give you a couple of examples as well of where coaching might be useful. So as I said, this is going to probably be one of several vlogs in a series. So in future videos, I think and I'd love to hear your comments on this, what you'd like to get out of this series. Love to hear whether you think this is the sort of thing that we should be talking about or whether we should be focusing on something else in relation to the good boss, bad boss in medicine issue. Um, but for future videos, what I thought we would talk about is things like what actually happens in a coaching session. You know, if you've never been coached before, what makes it different from some of those other things that you've um, maybe done before, like supervision or peer review or mentoring, etc. And look, there are very many different approaches to coaching. So, you know, cover a few of those. You know, coaching can be very much, can be very broad in its, uh, its scope. It can be focused on teaching a skill. It can be focused on just trying to develop some clarity and helping someone to grow and, and think about where they want to be in the future. So it can be quite broad. And that means there's lots of coaching models as well. So we might talk a bit about those too. Coaching models are all focused largely around this thing about coaching goals. In fact, I guess one of the key things of defining coaching is that generally we are looking to help the coachee, when you're the coach, to set some goals so that they can make some progress in whatever direction uh, they're attempting to head. One of the interesting things about coaching is it's not always clear to the coach or the coachee what they're wanting to get out of the coaching. So a lot of the effort in coaching is actually trying to firstly define what the issues might be and then set some clear goals for the coachee. And then another thing I think we can tackle at some point and a question that comes up for me quite often uh, in my current roles and certainly my previous roles is, Anthony, uh, I like this idea of coaching. It seems like I might, what I might need at the moment. How do I go about finding a good coach? You know, is there a list somewhere? You know, who's good? How do I know they're good? Um, who's going to suit me, that sort of thing. And I think that's a really reasonable question to be asking. So, you know, there's five or six topics already that we will try and tackle in this series. So here we are in YouTube and 
you see the Bad Med Bosses channel there and you see some of our videos. And uh, if you're wondering how to subscribe, well, you just have to click on this red subscribe button there. Thank you to the people who have subscribed so far. You can, of course, leave comments uh, in our discussion. But the reason I brought you here was that if we just search in YouTube alone, and I'm just going to type in the term coaching, uh, and I'm going to click search. Uh, there's an ad, but you can see we have about 21,600,000 results. Uh, building your inner coach, how coaching works, steps in the coaching process, what is coaching. So there's a lot out there about coaching, that's my point. And if you want to find out about things in a more general sense, uh, it's already there. So I'm going to try not to do that again uh, for you. I'm trying to, I want to really contextualize this issue around coaching and its relevance to the the medical career process. But for today, I think it's important, as I said, to start off with having a definition of what is coaching. And here's one, uh, the International Coach Federation, a very big organization, one of a couple out there that really provides quite a has a big strong membership and provides a framework for accrediting coaches and coaching programs etc they define coaching as this partnering with clients in a thought-provoking and creative process that inspires them to maximize their personal and professional potential so you see there it's about a relationship between a coach and a coachee and it's about a relationship where obviously there's some talking going on and some discussing going on, trying to provoke thoughts, trying to look at things in a creative way, which often means looking at things in a different way to the way you might be used to as the person that's in the coachy chair in order to get some sort of growth. So it's the, the core fundamental is about a relationship there. As I said, coaching is generally about setting goals. And so you may well have already come across this thing called SMART goals. You might have seen them in a individual performance development review framework. You might have seen them in terms of a strategic plan. Um, and SMART goals made famous by Peter Drucker, but actually developed by someone else initially. They're about you know setting goals for yourself, a specific measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound. So it's about trying to uh, define a goal that you can really touch and see and feel and know when you've gotten there. In, a, in another way of putting it, and I, I learned this from a mentor and coach that I have or have worked with in the past, it's about defining what success looks like. So that's great. That's a performance goal. Uh, but as I said, sometimes goals are not particularly clear at the outset and sometimes they're not it's not always appropriate to be focusing in on a performance goal. And often organizations focus too much on performance um, and in so doing overburden their organization, which means people struggle to meet the performance and get demoralized and you get a lack of productivity when they should also be focusing on other types of goals that are sort of stepping stones towards performance. So, so it, coaching is about goals, but it's about thinking about the type of goals that might be most appropriate. So some of the types of goals that might be defined in coaching are things like performance goals, and we've talked about them. And the, as I said, some of the things that the organization is interested in, but sometimes they do to the detriment of their own employees in the organization because they overdo it and they overburden the organization with too many things to perform on, so it leads to demoralization. And so performance goals are really good uh, and an excellent thing to be looking at in coaching, you know, if you want to be an improved leader or an improved surgeon or just a better JOMO, coaching is perfectly good for setting those sort of performance goals that you might have. But sometimes people come to the coaching process and a little bit, as I said, less clear about what they're wanting to achieve or they're at a bit of a crisis in their career or just seeking more purpose or just needing different directions. So things like a learning goal, you know, what do I need to learn about next can be very helpful in that context. Or just getting better at something or focusing in on an area to become a master or an expert as a goal, a mastery goal, can also be a useful goal to have in coaching. And hopefully you can see how being, how by defining what you need to learn next or become better at 
can be a strength um, when you come back to performance goals. Um, so there's some of the types of goals that there's some of the types of goals that might be defined in a coaching um, relationship. Now uh, that lends us to talk about models, and there are many out there. The one that most of you will probably be familiar with is the Grow model. This is credited to so many different people that I am not going to credit it to a particular person because it's really unclear. First came up with the idea. It's probably come up with by a number of people, and um, I guess it's a mnemonic that sticks because it's you know grow growth coaching helps you to grow. So it's quite a cool one from that partic particular perspective. So G stands for goals. So it's about setting goals in the coaching process. R is then about the reality. So it's sort of looking at okay, here's your goal, but what does the reality look like? And so where's the gap? How do we get from reality to the goal that you'll set for yourself? Which then leads to a discussion around options. You know, what are our options uh, for getting uh, from reality to the goal? And hopefully generating a number of options or solutions for doing that. Because often the process of coaching is encouraging the coachee to try one or two things and then come back and feedback you know, were they successful or not? Or, you know, and so, you know, not everything that you're going to do differently is going to work necessarily. Uh, and then W is for will. So it's about, you know, well, okay, we've, we've looked at the goal. We've looked at the reality. We've looked at your options. Are you going to change? Are you going to do something differently? Do you now have the will to go forward outside of the coaching relationship and give it a go? So that's the grow model. And it's useful for both the coachee and the coach. Uh, for the coach, it's a bit of a framework you can use to kind of go through the session and kind of get to grips with what the issues are and come up with some achievable goals and come up with a bit of a plan. And you might encourage, and some people are very strong advocates for this, that at the end of the session, there's a writing down of plans from the coachy perspective in terms of homework, things that they're going to do next time. So that's the GROW model. There's actually very a lot of reiterations of this and versions of it, etc. Um, one I've recently learned about workshop is the iGROW model. And I think the, the good thing about this is, is I, if you come back to my statement before, often the goal is not clear. Or, or sometimes even the goal comes in, you know, the, the coach he comes in and says, okay, I'm here for coaching because my goal is X. And when you get to talk about it a little bit more, you discover that maybe that's not actually the goal or maybe that's one goal, but there are other goals and you know which one is the most important. So actually just hearing about the issue first can be very useful and important in the process before you get to defining goals. Sometimes it's a problem that the coachee hasn't had a chance to talk to too many people about. So coaching is like many of those other things that we, uh, we do in medicine in terms of relationships like mentoring, supervising, etc. There is a bit of uh, utility in just allowing someone to vent for a period of time in the process. So that's the I grow model. One of the techniques that's often used in coaching, and as I said, we'll do a video on models and we'll do a video on what actually happens in coaching, but a lot of it's about clarifying from the coachee what's going on, or what their view of the world is, what the how they see the issues, and then try to look at them and encourage the coachee to look at them in different ways so that you can develop different insights and potential new ways of thinking about the issue and solving the problem or the options for achieving the goal. So we call that reframing. And a lot of the coaching is about just asking the right questions at the right time and trying to get in sync with the coachee uh, so that uh, both you and they feel that you're on the same wa wavelength. And we'll talk in a little minute about the difference between coaching and other things. Because one of the key things in coaching is to not get in there and solve the problem. I mean, sometimes you do have to give advice. Sometimes there is a point in a coaching relationship where advice is the most appropriate thing to do, but it's, it's generally not about advice. It's about helping the coachee to grow themselves. Hopefully through that, they actually learn some skills for themselves outside of the coaching relationship so they become better at seeing new solutions to their own problems. So let's talk about the evidence for coaching now because I know you're interested in that. You know, evidence is important to us as doctors. 
we're, we're taught to be critical of things, you know, there's particularly now in the age of the internet with so many opinions voiced across there, you, you know, it's important to take a critical eye of these things. So what is the evidence for coaching? Because you've probably already heard from a number of people that, you know, coaching is the way uh, it can really help enable you. We should have a coaching program for the whole organization. It could really help us become a high performing team, that sort of stuff. Look, I think when you drill down to it, the best way you can describe the evidence in one word is emerging. And the reason I say that is actually coaching, just like things like leadership, are very new fields in the range of human endeavors. You know, we're talking post World War II, really, uh, and maybe even later than that. So, you know, within one or two generations, a, a review of the literature around coaching in 2010 by Grant and others show that between 37 or 1937 and 99, there were only 93 papers and then you know, five times more papers in one decade after that. And I suspect it's gone sort of fivefold again since then. Because there's a lot of people looking at coaching models and coaching, you know, reviewing coaching. And so some of it's actually just defining ideas and having debates about what the best model is and what happens in coaching and how you should approach it before getting down to, you know, sort of studies like randomized trials or just trials where they're looking at, is there a significant effect between uh, across the coaching? There, there are some studies now um, that do show that there are significant shifts um, when you use certain coaching models in things like stress and anxiety of the coachee, development of in insight, and even confidence in solving problems. Yet to see a paper that shows that the coaching had that sort of very high level Miller's Pyramid type outcome of you know having a, a change in performance at the end uh, but certainly if you look at the ratings from the coaches lots of factors that show that on that level it's helpful and certainly when you talk to people who engage in coaching they talk about how it's been a useful process for them probably even stronger though is in terms of evidence base is to recognize that coaching is within a broad remit of a range of sort of approaches to helping in relationship um, um, more from like a business um, non-clinical perspective but it's actually drawing techniques and things that have been shown to work uh, and well demonstrated in the psychotherapies so you know for example there's a whole area of psychotherapy around solution-focused therapy, uh, where coaching draws a lot of its strategies and models from. Cognitive behavior therapy uh, coaching drives a lot of, well, some coaching models at least derive a lot from as well. And so we know that those therapies have actually good strength of evidence. And so we're just applying them in a different scenario. I, I hesitate to say in a non-clinical population because sometimes one of the things you come across in the uh, the coaching process is clinical problems. You know, people are individuals, they, they have lots of issues that they bring to coaching. Certainly we're looking at it in a, you know, a, a wellness uh, framework. Um, a lot of coaching models around positive psychology as well. You know, we believe that the coach is capable of change. Uh, sorry, we believe the coachee is capable of changing. The coach is uh, hopefully capable of changing as well. So, you know, that, that lends itself to the strength of evidence around coaching. And coaching and mentoring becoming endorsed by medical groups as pro appropriate approaches to assist in performance. So, for example, if you go to the GMC website, they, there's various endorsements for mentoring and coaching models. Now, some of that comes from trying to improve performance of underperformers. But actually, there's a recognition now, and I'm in a, a group of senior doctors who are sort of recognising that coaching can be very useful for high performers as well. You know, trying to solve some of those wicked problems in health. Now I mentioned there's some similarities between coaching and other things. And so I've listed five here and you could probably come up with a few more. So we've got coaching and mentoring, coaching and consulting, coaching and supervision, coaching and performance review or performance management, if you want to call it that, coaching and counseling. And we've just spent a little bit of time talking about counseling. Uh, and the fact that uh, counselling and psychotherapies 
have sort of uh, lent some of their evidence and ideas to coaching. So what's core, what's the what's the sort of similarity here? Well, it's, you look you can probably debate this, but I'd say the one key point of similarity is these are all relationships, and they're all and, and probably the second thing is generally the relationship is between two people where one is coming for some assistance and the other one is trying to assist. Hopefully, again I hesitate because we've all probably been in those situations where perhaps we're someone who's being supervised by someone who's not overly committed to being the supervisor. But in theory, it's about someone assisting someone else within a relationship. But of course, th there are overlaps, um, but then there are differences. And so if we look at two, or just do two, let's look at coaching and mentoring. So some of the differences between coaching and mentoring are, uh, in mentoring, you've often got a power difference. In fact, it, it probably doesn't work if you don't. You know, you've got someone a little bit more senior than you, sometimes often a lot more senior than you, who's kind of sharing their experiences with you as you go along a journey that that is similar to them. So there also has to be a level of expertise there. So there's the power difference, the role modeling themselves to you and the sharing your experience and a bit of their experience. Well, if we look at coaching, oftentimes in coaching, we, we do still have a power difference. Sometimes we're beneath in the relationship, sometimes we're above, sometimes luckily we're in the middle. But often, often one of the things in coaching is to try and level that power difference so that we're on the same level and we sort of can see each other as equals. And we're, rather than role modeling, we're kind of analyzing where things are at the moment and trying to draw out solutions. If we then look at the difference between supervision and coaching. Again, in supervision, we've got that power difference. In coaching, we try to reduce that power difference. Supervision is often about checking the performance, sort of oversight, and by virtue of that, providing some feedback, oftentimes bad, hopefully quite a lot of positive, but we know that that sometimes doesn't happen in real life as well as much as it should be. Whereas in coaching, it's more about understanding where the person is in terms of their performance and not criticizing, not, not, you know, not pointing out their flaws but trying to encourage their own insight in terms of are they where they need to be and so that they can grow. So, you know, and look, other coaching experts will probably be able to embellish on those points, but I'm just trying to draw out some of the, the differences there so you can see some of the differences and so therefore see how coaching could be a new and novel way to get the results that perhaps you're struggling with achieving at the moment in your work or your personal life or other endeavors uh, for that matter. So there's a couple of sort of differences and similarities uh, discussions there. So I talked about giving some examples just to try and contextualize it because I think that's very important when you're teaching uh, abstract concepts, or, you know, coaching being one of those and trying to relate it to the context of medicine. So look, these are a couple of typical examples that, you know, I've had experience with as a coach in helping people with. So the first example is you've got a trainee who's struggling to come to grips with the training program. And look, I, I have a lot of sympathy for trainees these days. I don't think this is my retrospectoscope. You, the, the, the tasks, the requirements for completing training programs seem to have become exponentially more broad. I think the underlying thing with there is that there's more, uh, there's better educational uh, theory underpinning it, but it does seem like what a trainee has to do these days in some programs is quite a lot. And so the trainee may feel overwhelmed by that. So how might a coaching model help in that situation? Well, you know, we might first initially help to crystallize the issue with the trainee. And, and that might be that they feel that there's just too many training tasks. I just don't know where to start. Um, I just want to focus on being a good doctor. You hear that quite a bit. You often see trainees detrimenting themselves by focusing in on the clinical work and saying, I'll get to that training task, that long case or that workplace-based assessment next week, you know, kind of putting it off because it's just overwhelming. So through that, you might identify a goal with, from the trainee, which is, you know, I want to accomplish a few tasks in the training log for this year or this six months or whatever it is. And so the solution might be to sort of, and this is, a, this is one of these sort of common solutions in, in coaching, is to sort of look at the, the issue from a different perspective in terms of not looking at the whole 
I've got to complete this fellowship program, but chunking it down into small, smaller, more manageable bits. And that's a CBT method, by the way. So the solution might be to have a go at tackling one or two important tasks out of training over the next six months so that you know, you're setting yourself up for a bit of success in the training program. So that's how the coaching model might help a trainer. You can hopefully see how the mentoring model and the supervising model might try and do that differently, but might struggle. So a mentoring model might be more about, you know, well, yeah, I struggled a bit with it, or uh, it's been so long since I've done the training program, it seems a bit different to me, but, you know, it's important to see the end goal, etc. But it might not get to that sort of, you know, point of sort of getting the trainee to think about chunking it down. I, I guess as a mentor, you might sort of share experience where you went through the same and you chunked it down, but you're kind of giving them the solution rather than getting them to see it for themselves. So let's look at our second example. And again, this is a very common, typical example, at least in my experience. It's the junior consultant who's overwhelmed with extra responsibilities. You know, what often happens for junior consultants, let's talk about someone who's in their first 12 months from being a trainee, now in a consultant role, is that they, they start to you know, realize that there's a lot more to do in the job at the next level. And they feel like they don't have enough time for those responsibilities. They're often management responsibilities, you, you know, most consultants have a level of management responsibility, whether they've got a manager or director title in their role. And that's just what happens. But they just, they feel overwhelmed because they're also practicing clinical medicine the way they used to as a trainee. They're spending as much time with all the patients as they used to, reviewing things, setting up management plans, etc. And of course that doesn't work because they've got three or four times as many patients as they used to. And not many consultants are that super efficient to be able to do that, as well as the extra stuff that's required as a consultant. Of course, we know one of the solutions there is to become a bit more confident in delegating responsibilities. So how might a coaching model help a junior consultant with that challenge? Well, firstly, they might help the consultant to identify that they have an issue where there are too many tasks, too little time. Then they might help them to Think of a, how that might look in terms of a goal, which might be, and remember we're talking about the learning goals and not so much the performance goals uh, or the mastery goals. So this might be one of those sort of learning or mastery goals. Be, be clearer about what jobs are mine. And that might be a learning experience for someone. And it might need a degree of experimenting. Because one of the issues around delegating initially is having the trust and confidence that you've set good indicators so that, you know, if the buck stops with you still, the things come back when you need them to, so you, you're not worried that things are gone missing without you knowing about them. So, so you, one solution, one option that might come out through that coaching session or series of sessions might be to experiment with delegating. Just give it a go. You know, why don't you just give a little bit more responsibility to that trainer you've been telling me about that you think is capable of it, and just report back to me how that went for them and for you. You know, did it did it help with your goal? So that's a second example. That's really everything I wanted to talk to you about today. As I said, I think going to be a really cool series on on tools for senior bosses and within that a mini series about coaching as a tool and technique i would like to leave you with one final thought though one of the things that i like about coaching is that you can pair it with another tool that i think is really useful for the development uh, of uh, someone in their medical career which is a what we call a 360 degree evaluation a multi-source feedback so we'll probably do a vlog on that and we'll probably do a vlog around 360s. Maybe there's a few vlogs on those. And then a vlog about how to pair your 360 with your coaching experience. But, you know, oftentimes 360, the results of 360 feedbacks are really accelerated and empowered if you're doing them with a coach that you've got a good relationship with. So I'd leave you with that thought that if you're thinking about coaching at the moment, Maybe think about also 360s, even if you've done one already in the past. So thank you for watching. I hope you're getting a lot out of this series. Please subscribe, turn on the notifications, tell your friends about it. Leave us some comments, some thumbs up, thumbs down. We don't care. Uh, give us some feedback. Are we doing the right stuff? Uh, is this what you need? And thank you. Mm -hmm.